Come into the house of the Lord, all God's people. Come singing songs of great praise and glory, for this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning and welcome home. My name is Bobby Fisher, and I am blessed to lead you in worship this morning while Pastor Tom is at the UCC General Synod in Indianapolis. It is an honor to Tom and to Memorial Congregational Church that he was selected, all expenses paid, to be a representative from the Southern New England Conference of the UCC. This morning and every day, we welcome all on a journey of acceptance, connection, meaning, and purpose. Welcome to everyone joining us in the sanctuary and online wherever you are, um, know that no matter who you are, no matter where you are physically, no matter where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Please rise as we join our voices together singing our opening hymn, number 722 from the Blue Chalice Hymnal, found in your, pew in your pews, This Is My Song. Thank you.
Please join me in the spirit of prayer. Holy One, you patiently wait for us on the threshold of your realm, ready to welcome us as we step across the doorway of your kingdom. As we are inviting, as we see your inviting lights, we feel the warmth of your love. May we open doors to your realm. May we be your encouraging embrace and your melodic voice of welcome in a world filled with harsh tones. Amen. Each Sunday we renew our promises to God and to one another. If these words are unfamiliar with you, please feel free to listen. Please join me now as we recite together the covenant of Memorial Congregational Church found in your bulletin. In the love of truth and in the spirit of Jesus, we unite for the worship of God and the service of humanity. And as the Lord's free people, we agree to walk together in all God's ways made known or to be made known to us. Please be seated. Before I begin with the scripture reading, I will just say that usually we have communion on the first Sunday of um, each month, but we will be not having it this for this month of July, but we will be having it in August. The scripture reading and the sermon that follows and some of the prayers will be heard at the General Synod this afternoon. We are grateful that the UCC has made it possible for us to worship in spirit with Pastor Tom and those in our denomination who are gathered together to help us be church, doing God's work in the world. So the scripture reading is from Matthew 10, verses 28 through 39. This is the new revised standard version that I am reading. Jesus said to his disciples, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs on your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are more valued than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that you have brought, come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be <clears throat> members of one's own household. Whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. And just, I'm just very grateful that I don't have to preach on that scripture, but we are most fortunate today to have um, from the General Synod, which is going to be given this afternoon, but. Um, the Reverend um, Cheryl Lindsay, um, who's the UCC Minister of Worship and, and Theology, she is going to present the sermon, and they sent it to us ahead of time so we can be there in spirit and in thought and prayer with um, everyone there. So, Greetings. My name is the Reverend Dr. Cheryl Lindsay. I'm Minister for Worship and Theology for the United Church of Christ. It is my pleasure to share with you my thoughts on Matthew 10, verses 28 through 39, and my title is Welcome the Prophetic. Imagination. 
Imagination is the ability to conceptualize what's not been realized, to conjure in our mind a picture that has not been drawn, to hear the notes of a song that has never been played, and to conceive a world that has never been true. When we imagine, we do not lie to ourselves. We know the difference between dream and reality. Rather, imagining proclaims not yet over never will be. We can't over we can't and possible over impossible. Our faith relies upon imagination. As noted in Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Even for the early disciples who enjoyed the privilege of witnessing the ministry of Jesus for themselves, their faith would be stretched, tested, and transformed by the radical teachings of Jesus, as well as the improbable things he assured them they would do. In our gospel text, Jesus prepares his disciples to be sent off as apprentices, a first step towards the assumption of leadership after his physical departure. As someone trained in the trade of carpentry, Jesus would have been particularly familiar with the model of apprentice expert development. He would already identified those who, with potential to work with him and to grow into leadership. Jesus nurtured his relationship with them and interspersed teaching with demonstration. Now the time has come for the apprentices to use their newly acquired understanding and skills. Jesus is not, in, not letting them go off on their own forever, but they will be operating under the power he's given them on their own. Matthew's entire gospel contains the story of commissioning the disciples to continue the ministry of Jesus. Even the genealogies and birth narratives serve in part to establish the authority of Jesus, which he spends the remainder of the gospel training humans to receive that delegation of authority as found in the Great Commission. Matthew tells his audience, a group of insiders who've been waiting on the chosen one to deliver them, that the Messiah has come with an ultimate end of delegating the work of fully realizing the kingdom to them. What Jesus has done, they'll be called to do. Jesus taught, so they will teach. Jesus healed, so they will heal. Jesus confronted those in authority. They will confront authority figures. Jesus demonstrated the kingdom in his day-to-day -day life. They will demonstrate the kingdom as they go. Jesus developed disciples. They will de develop disciples. The work and ministry of Jesus will become theirs. Jesus sends them as agents of redemption, reconciliation, and restoration on earth. His ministry has always been incarnational, present and tangible among the people. Theirs will be incarnational as well. At the same time, the ministry is invitational, never imposed, which makes welcome central to its fruitfulness. He also ties that representation to the ministry of the prophet, who represents God's vision of creation as well as admonition and encouragement that, in pro that proclaims that vision is possible. The prophetic is imaginative. As Walter Brueggemann notes in the prophetic imagination, the prophet engages in futuring fantasy. The prophet does not act if the vision can be implemented for questions of implementation of no consequence until the vision can be imagined. The imagination must come before the implementation. Our culture is competent to implement almost anything and to imagine almost nothing. The same royal consciousness that makes it possible to implement anything and everything is the one that shrinks imagination because imagination is a danger. Thus, every totalitarian regime is frightened of the artist. It's the vocation of the prophet to keep alive the ministry of imagination, to keep on conjuring and proposing future alternative to the single one the king wants to urge as the only thinkable one. When we understand imagination as a primary element the prophet engages, we may also consider how that limits our ability to receive it. Not every prophet has the ability to convey a vision in a way that sparks the curiosity and consideration of their audience. Everyone doesn't have the same capacity to imagine. We would all be inventors if the gift of conceptualizing the unknown were widely distributed. Garrett Morgan invented the traffic light and the gas mask. Marie Van Britten Brown invented a video home security system. 
As Patrick J. Kigler states, from the tip of South America to the Arctic, Native Americans developed scores of innovations from kayaks, protective goggles and baby bottles to birth control, genetically modified food crops and analgesic medications that enabled them to survive and flourish wherever they lived. Dr. Jose Hernandez Robelar created an electronic glove which translates hand movements from the American Sign Language into spoken and written words. All of these inventions required imagination to address a problem, a need, or a gap. Imagination is a gift, not everyone receives it. Yet problems can be easy to recognize. We may try to avoid them or go around them, but normally we can identify that we have a problem, even if we don't know the source or the ramifications of it. Inventors see a problem and conceptualize a solution to fix it. Prophets see the condition of this world through the lens of the creator and speak a word of truth to repent, redeem, and restore. Prophets envision reconnection where there's been disconnection. Prophet gives hope to the hopeless. Prophets tell a broken world that healing is possible. At the same time, prophets warn of the peril of life apart from God. Prophets predict the consequences of willful and reckless behavior. Prophets discomfort those who live in comfort at the expense of their vulnerable and marginalized neighbors. Encouragement and correction both thrive on imagination oriented to the future. It's much easier to remember. Unfortunately, in our remembering, we can engage selectively. Nostalgia can stifle attempts to imagine a possible future as we compare the cost of reaching for it versus grasping for a romanticized past, no matter how futile that attempt may be. How often does the Holy One encourage God's people to forget the former things? Carrying the burdens of the past restricts our ability to welcome the present and to hope for the future promised by the one who makes all things new. At the same time, the biblical witness often calls the people towards remembrance. The prophets often use the act of remembering in order to stimulate the imagination. Remember what God has done for you. Remember this problem of the past that speaks to the challenges of the present. Remember how the Holy One abided with you, made a way for you, and never abandoned you. The remembering serves as testimony that what seems impossible becomes possible through divine imagination, intervention, and activity. Miracles happen. People change. Life becomes better. The kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven. Remember so you can imagine a hopeful future. Remember so you can live into the possibilities. This is the consistent message of the prophet that calls the church to be a people that imagines the kingdom into being. Now, I consider myself to be a trekker. My father introduced me to the original series through the reruns we used to watch weekly. That series presented an aspirational vision of the future. By the time Star Trek The Next Generation premiered, my favorite, that's why I'm a trekker, much of the original series was outdated because what had first been imagined had become realized. The same has happened with The Next Generation. We can read books on portable devices. We can even communicate with our phones and have them talk back to us. Hey, Siri. Yes. Never mind. Artificial intelligence. Okay. Artificial intelligence is not a fantastical dream. It has become a lived reality we must wrestle with in use and outcome. I would not be surprised if someone is still working toward the day when we can say, hey, beam me up, Scotty even more than the technological advances Star Trek envisioned a future with the deeply entrenched differences and acrimony of the present are set aside. The Russian ensign serving on the crew during the Cold War and its corresponding space race was a sign that our enemies can become our compatriots. Star Trek also demonstrated racial and ethnic harmony and collegiality, countering the conditions that inspired the civil rights movement. It was a vision of the possible in the midst of oppression and resistance. In this gospel passage, Jesus also emphasizes ideals and conceptual values of welcome, prophecy, righteousness, and reward. 
the same time, he does not allow us to disentangle word from deed. He gives a remarkably specific example in verse 22. Whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The gospel is rooted in real lives, relational interactions, and human need. In this statement, Jesus lifts up the lowly and humbles the exalted while encouraging compassion, generosity, and hospitality. Matthew presents a radical Jesus who liberates through practical acts of meeting human need. The church continues to struggle with diversity, mutuality, and belonging at a time when culturally we have never been more aware of the vast range of distinctiveness among us. Racial, ethnic, gender, age, and ability are only a sampling of the ways in which we are distinct. Political and theological differences may also be measured among us. Difference and distinctiveness are not necessarily divisive in and of themselves. Divisiveness is a response, a choice that makes a neighbor into an enemy simply because we are not uniform in identity, expression, or thought. Welcome does the opposite. In these three verses, Jesus uses that word six times. It's an active verb that speaks of hospitality and service. To welcome means to prioritize the comfort of the other over one's own. I grew up in a small two-family home. My parents, sister, and I lived on the second floor. We had two bedrooms, one bath, living room, dining room, and kitchen. In those six rooms, plus two porches, we lived our lives as a family. When relatives came to visit, my parents would give up their bedroom and sleep on the recliners in our living room. Now they were pretty comfortable watching television or spending an evening in conversation. Sleeping in them all night, however, would leave one stiff and a little achy in the morning. My parents never complained and their demonstration of hospitality still informs my understanding of what welcome means. What if we, treated the world that we encounter every day in the same world way we treat a favored guest. As a member of the family whose comfort was as important as our own, pursuit of our own comfort keeps us from hard and holy conversation. Preservation of our comfort maintains the siloed sanctuaries we find in so many of our faith communities. Prioritizing our comfort destroys our imagination and hope for a beloved future. We can choose welcome over comfort, and when we welcome the prophetic, we encourage ourselves. We imagine a present and future where the impossible is achieved, where the kingdom of God is complete and has come all around us, and where love and grace abide within us and through us. Welcome the prophetic in the sanctuary, online and on site. Welcome the prophetic in the public square. Welcome the prophetic in the voting booth or absentee ballot. Welcome the prophetic in chance encounters. Welcome the prophetic at our borders and in our businesses. Welcome the prophetic when it confirms what you believe and when it challenges what you know. Welcome the prophetic with family and foe. Welcome the prophetic in your prayers and in your ways. Let God's kingdom come and God's will be done. Welcome the prophetic. Amen? Amen. Please rise. Hymn 82. Thank you. 
God is watching our, um, as we sing this song, um, we, when we were talking about it, Rachel wasn't, this one she wasn't certain about that she knew. This is the, so anyway, we're, we've got the message. Thank you. And we, and we also want to um, particularly thank you, Tyler, for playing the piano and being here with us. We appreciate it. Very nice. Let's see. We gather together in prayer, knowing that God hears us and that we are called to support each other. When the time comes, if you have a prayer to offer, please raise your hand and I will bring you the microphone. If you are watching online, please leave your prayer in the Zoom chat. Let us be together in prayer. God of community, be with us now. Give us the voice to raise our joys and to speak our concerns. Give us courage to help one another. Hear us now as we lift up our prayers to you. So. Let us pray. God, this is a prayer for the General Synod. God of small sanctuaries and large halls, we listen and look for your presence immediately surrounding us, energizing us to serve the world outside. And today we know that many of our neighbors and friends are gathering in Indianapolis for General Synod as they celebrate faith, reflect in your calling, seek justice and kindness, and inhale the invigorating breath of the Spirit. We pray for their wisdom, Holy One. May your wisdom carry them from one moment to the next as they search for the depths of your love. We pray for their endurance, loving spirit. Throughout the long days of synod, may they find rest and renewal, moments of hope and silence and joyous laughter. We pray for their strength, divine redeemer. May your courage permeate their hearts as they speak and vote. And may your holy curiosity open their souls to new stories. May each of us be willing to open our souls to new words, new sounds, new stories, and new songs. Your kingdom can be found from the conversation between two people drinking coffee to the most distant gal galaxies across the universe. May we see how to serve the church and your children within the walls of our individual sanctuaries to the streets surrounding us, to the farthest spaces of our world. Amen. And God, sometimes we don't have words to pray or we aren't sure what to pray for, but we know that you know our needs before we do. And so we take a moment in silence to lift up our unspoken prayers to you.
Gracious God, we give you thanks for all that you have given us. We are grateful for those who help us explore our faith and bring us to a greater understanding of you and your word, world. We are especially thankful for the teachings of Jesus Christ who taught us so much and who gave us words to pray when we don't have our own. We lift up his prayer now, praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now for a few announcements. Um, we thank you to everyone who contributes, contributed items and helped assemble the menstrual hygiene kits. We reached our goal of 50 kits. Um, yeah, that was very good. And Hal, you have an announcement to make, if you would, here. have a parade float tomorrow, uh, excuse me, Tuesday. It's a last minute decision, but uh, Judy Hawkins and I, who have been doing parade floats in Sudbury since the 1950s, couldn't bear not to have Memorial Church represented in the uh, parade tomorrow, uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. <laughs> we'll go with Tuesday. We, we'll be assembling the, um, the float at our barn uh, tomorrow afternoon and evening. You can see some pictures of past uh, floats uh, in case you want to see the kind of scope of work that we have to do. Anyway, anybody that would like to help out is welcome. Um, Monday afternoon and Monday evening, we'll be welcoming anybody. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Hal. Um, if you have a financial offering for the church, please leave it in one of the offering plates in the sanctuary exit. You can also go to mccsudbury.org slash donate at any time to find a variety of ways to give. Thank you for your generosity. We are grateful for all the ways that the folks contribute to MCC through time, talent, and treasure. And please rise. Now go forth into the world and serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Loving and serving God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit, now and into your life everlasting. Amen. We have received God's blessing. Now we offer a blessing to one another as we sing hymn 434, God be with you till we meet again. <laughs>